Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. We release a new episode every Sunday morning. Today, my guest is Michael Lewis, author of Going Infinite, The Rise and Fall of a New Tycoon. This is the new book about Sam Bankman-Fried, the crypto wunderkind who is now on trial on charges including wire fraud, securities fraud, commodities fraud, and money laundering. Though Michael needs no introduction, I will offer one anyway. You know him from his numerous best-selling works of narrative nonfiction. You may in fact be someone like John Williams of the New York Times Book Review who wrote, I would read an 800-page history of the stapler if he wrote it. I'm certain that I would as well, and not just because my preliminary research actually indicates that the stapler's origin is somewhat controversial. But actually, I should not digress. Um, What drew me to Michael's writing initially were his Follow the Money books. These include his debut work, Liar's Poker, about binge-eating bond traders on Wall Street in the 1980s, as well as The Big Short, published in 2010 about a scrappy selection of investors who saw that the toxic mortgage-linked securities bubble was about to burst and made billions on the related trades. Several of Michael's books have been made into feature films, including The Big Short, directed by Adam McKay, as well as Moneyball and The Blind Side. What keeps me reading Michael's work are the unexpected discoveries about the fragility of our government infrastructure, such as with The Fifth Risk, and more recently, his now already controversial and very nuanced take on Sam Bakeman fried Let's dive in. So, anything new happening in your life? Um, not much. It's kind of quiet out there. I've, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I published a book uh, four days ago. Um, yeah. About us. Oh, you write? I, You're a writer? That's so cool. Yeah, no, it's a little thing I do on the side. <laughs> Mainly, I'm a softball coach ba- and a basketball coach, but and and um, and a bon vivant. I, I'm very social, but um, I like bon vivant. That's always it's always nice. Um, um, but you you coach you coach softball. I, in my, in my career, I've coached. Yeah, I've spent an awful lot of my time coaching children how to play things that they they'd probably be better off not playing after I'm done with them. But it's uh. But yes, so uh, and- so congratulations uh, on the book. Um, obviously, I have I have read it, um, and it's you are making making the book tour rounds for Going Infinite. Where ha- you've done, I guess sixty minutes and Chris Hayes. What else have you done so far? So this is a has been a little bit of an unusual tour um, in that the, we sixty minutes did a big takeout on the book on Sunday. But the deal was it had to be embargoed. And so the book was just not like hidden from people until mm-hmm. until my, nobody's had really had a chance to read it until kind of now. And so I, so I didn't, I came out of my, I came out of my cave on Monday and did CBS this morning and three or four radio shows and Chris Hayes and Fareed Zakaria and um, NPR and I don't know, it's like, and I'm and I'm off. I'm now in Washington. Did the we did an oh, I did nice. an event at the Washington Post last night um, with my Fine. friend David Shipley, who is the opinion editor there. And I'm off to London tomorrow. And I had to go to London and Manchester and Dublin, and then Miami and New Orleans and Los Angeles and oh my and God. Portland. Uh, so you're literally in that part of the book tour where you wake up in the middle of the night. And you're not sure where you are. You know that does happen. Um, what happens more often with me is I wake up in the middle of the night and I wish I was home. Uh, th- yeah. th- you get to a point where I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I will be there next week. Roundabout man, <laughs> roundabout Manchester. I'll wonder what on earth am I doing out here and why? Do, why does this have to be this way? Um, and I guess it does have to be this way. Briefly during COVID, it didn't have to be this yeah. way. It was kind of fun right. just going down to your desk and and doing every show from your desk. Um, but this is the way it's kind of, I had, yeah, I had a book come out, uh, during, during uh, COVID and in, uh, late September of 2020. And it was great. It was great for the copy editing process. And it was great for the sitting at my desk going on a book tour process, but that has changed. Um, so you, are you doing any, besides the Washington post is, is, are you doing any sort of face to face gatherings or these mostly sort of just like 
you know, broadcast or cable. No, 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 no. I think I have two big events, like 800 person events in London, one in Manchester, one in Dublin. Um, Dublin, I'm in St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is, I've done that before. And it's just a gas. It's an, you have an odd relationship wow. with the audience uh, because it's so long and narrow. It's like talking in shark, you know, it's right. this big, I guess it's Gothic, but it feels Gothic um, cathedral. Right. And it's, um, and so I got one there and then everywhere else I go, it's face to face. Miami, a big event. Walter Isaacson, the author of a new book about Elon Musk and I are doing a 2000 person yes. event in New Orleans, um, city arts and lecture in San Francisco, a big, a big book event in Portland. I have one of them. I, I have one in Chicago where, um, I don't know how they've done this. Um, three, they bought 3000 books and there are 3000, at least 3000 people going to be there. So it's, it's mostly, wow. it's mostly that it's, it's, there is the media, there's media this week and next, but after that, it's mostly me talking to large numbers of people in some auditorium. So you chose, um, an interesting time to, I wouldn't say embed yourself, but to become interested in Sam Bankman Freed, as well as to release a book, uh, right when he is literally on trial, um, in the Southern District of New York, uh, right now, as we speak. I mean, I could be checking my Twitter feed, but I, I, I can't multitask like that. And as you can see, I'm not playing a video game. Uh, my eyes are darting because I'm looking at my notes <laughs> on the screen. But so, so you're so. And first, let me just begin by saying I love this book. Thank you. I'm. I hear the criticism that you know, you know, any book that comes out on any topic, there's going to be positive and negative feedback. And I see this as a piece of the story. And I wonder how you, how you're, what do you perceive as, I guess, the greatest strengths of this book? I think the New Yorker review of it that I just read yesterday gets that. And how do you perceive the pushback you're getting? And and, and, and how do you kind of synthesize all that? Um, so the books, the books, the story, right? And I had the strength. The strengths start with the, just the level of access I had, and it wasn't just a yeah. Sam Bankman Freed. It was his whole world. And then I was there. I think it's very hard to tell the story unless you had a pretty intimate knowledge of the place before it collapsed. So mm -hmm. I and I, I had done a kind of a pr pretty thorough reporting job on FTX in the year leading up to the collapse without having written anything of this book. And that, and it gave me a context for what happened. It gave me an ability to communicate with the, after it all collapsed with the, with the principal characters, because they gotten to know me and most of them were perfectly happy to continue to talk to me. Um, so that, so the, the, having the kind of before and after and having a kind of an on the scenes view of the thing. And, um, and especially then after it collapses, kind of still being inside and watching how people are behaving. I don't know. I just got so I, like I got, from October, like October. Would you say the collapse? Would you November. peg that at like October twenty twenty two? November, November, November twenty twenty two. And I and uh, okay. so I just had. I'm only as good as my material. This I found long ago, and <laughs> uh, and the, I'm constrained either by what I've not been able to see or hear, or who I've not been able to talk to. Also constrained by just like how the the literary quality of the characters. And I felt that this was a case where I was constrained only by my powers because the material was so good. And it was, it, it, this, this sort of expressed itself in the writing. Um, one, the quality of the material that was on the cutting room floor when I was done was so good, I think I could make another book of it. That it was, there was so much mm -hmm. stuff that was good. And that usually doesn't happen. It does happen to me that, oh. It, wait, wait, can you give me one example? Do you want to? Uh, <laughs> well, cutting well sure. Um, well, I'll give you a whole category of example that after okay. after the collapse, um, I was I was essentially squirreled away inside the Albany Resort in the Bahamas where Sam Bankman Fried and all his colleagues lived. And um, had free run of the place and of him. And every day would come back after interviewing him, getting colleagues on the phone, picking through the condominiums they lived in where all their possessions had been left behind. And I would write a journal. Mm -hmm. And the journal was like 2,000 words a day. 
And it wow. was the stuff, it read so well. It was just so electric, the material that I thought, well, when I get to this place in the book, um, I'm just going to be able to just grab this and use it and take it. Mm-hmm. And I ended up using almost none of it. It's its own separate thing that just didn't fit into the book. Um, it's 30,000 words that could almost stand alone as a narrative of a collapse. And I used bits and pieces, but but this like lots of stuff. Just I didn't use it as 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 it was written at the time. That was unusual that I actually wrote a whole bunch that I thought was great. Never stopped thinking it was great, but it just slowed down the narrative when I got to it. Um, so I, I, it and didn't add anything. That's so interesting because it can be really fun to immerse yourself in a world. But I, I understand what the if the pace is a, if you have a certain pace for most of the book, you can't just sort of correct get people bogged down and change it. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, So the, the being, so that you're texting me, the strengths of the thing was, I just felt I am limited only by my powers and, and that material is that good. And the way it, so, and, and what got left out was so good was that's a good sign. But also, um, when I got to the back end of the thing, like the last mm-hmm. third of the book, um, mm-hmm. it started to write itself that it was, it, there was. You know, when you're telling a story, when you, there, it's like a jungle and there are paths through the jungle and there, there's more than one path. Mm-hmm. And it takes a while for me, usually when I'm working on something, to figure out what path I want to take. And I have a high degree of uncertainty in the beginning as I'm moving through the jungle. <laughs> Is there a better, am I, should- I feel the same way. <laughs> right? And, so, yeah. and, and, and I got to the point, it was like I was hacking through the jungle for the first 40 or 50 pages. And then it got, the path got- I thought, hmm, I found a soft spot in the jungle. This is actually a great way through the jungle. And then when I got to the last third of the jungle, the jungle just vanished. It was just like clear sailing. And so- What was that? What is that inflection point in the book where you think it, it sort of, it, where it clears, um, would you say? When you t- or what time frame? When you turn the page and I've shown up on the scene. Uh, and, yes, and, yes. And, it's- and then you show up and you say something like it's really easy to steal from Sam Bankman Free that line or the something. The most striking or... thing about Sam Bankman Free was how easy he was <laughs> to steal from. Yes. And God, and, that, and, yes. And then yes, and you're rifling through his desk or something. That's right. <laughs> going through the and, yeah. and love and, that. Yeah. And th- from then so this is something it only occurred to me after I, the book was sent off to the printer that that I n- had never happened to me. The way I work um all my, I, I handwrite notes when I'm interviewing people. I put them into my um, laptop. I type them up that night. And each stage is a sort mm-hmm. of a winnowing away. Like I don't write it down everything they say. I write down what interests me. I don't type up all my notes. So I type up what interests me. There's a sort of filtering that's going on. And in the end, yeah. I've got this yeah. giant file, just one fat file. It's like distilled. Called Travels, totally yeah, distilled. It was called Travels with Sam. Uh, that was, and, and uh <laughs> And it was 300,000 words. The book's 95,000 words. And, and I cull from that file um, when I am built writing the book. But normally mm-hmm. what I do, because I'm afraid there was something that I really wanted to do that I didn't do or something, some, something, some incident I left out, after I'm done, I usually go through that file again and think, Right. And you say, and you go through the glean. Did I leave this out? Did I leave? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't, right. I didn't do it this time. In fact, I still have not done it. And I, I it, it, it was so, I was so sure of where the book was going that I just forgot about the file. And, uh, and that was a completely new experience. So the challenges, uh, that, so that, that's the first thing that pops to mind. You say like the strengths of the book is just the, the quality. The material is so high. And, yes. and I can, yes. I, I have my limitations as a writer. I bump up against them. You know, it's the best I can do kind of thing. It isn't the problem with the book is not the material. If there's a problem with the book, I don't actually think there's a problem. I think it's my favorite book that I've ever written, but whatever. I love this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I want you to, before you go on to the critiques, tell me why it's your favorite book. It was so. Is it because it's the most recent one and you always fall in love with your latest No, because you actually catch me in the book tour and it's usually when I hate the book the most. Uh, is is a- after I've been <laughs> speaking of it for three or four days. So I'm not in a particularly <laughs> euphoric state about my book. 
it was, uh, I thought I was doing lots of things at once and leaving and creating a thing that readers would interact with in a really interesting way. And, and there was just depths to it. There were, I thought, I mean, again, for it's quite. I see that. I think, and, and let me just say, I, the reason why I asked you about some of the critiques is because, and I could articulate them, but I think, I think what I'd like to say instead first is what I think you're saying. And I just want to say it before, so you can just nod your head and say, you're totally right. Which <laughs> is, I think there's a lot of, you're, there's a lot of nuance here. And there's more ambiguity in this book. It's a puzzle. Yes. And I, I think that it, I think what makes it beautiful is it you as, first of all, the story, you know, the access, the details. I think there's that. Um, getting deep into meeting a character who is himself somewhat of an enigma, but that as a, the reader has to decide. Yes. You're not, you are not dogmatic. Um, you are not apologetic. Um, you are welcoming us into welcoming us into a world we would not have access to. And I see breadcrumbs. I mean, you you use the metaphor of your writing as like you're going through. You don't know where you're going in the jungle, and then you saw your path. As a reader, I'm using a different for. I'm using a forest metaphor, and I see breadcrumbs here. Yeah. And I see the breadcrumbs going in places. I see red flag, I guess, red flags and breadcrumbs. And it, it, you know, it leads me not to, not to a place of, I mean, I look at this going, oh, wow, I see a lot of red flags and I see, um, like, I'm going to say it differently. There's this, no one is ever, not a judge, not a jury, not, no human is ever going to get Sam Bankman free to say one way or another, yes. I committed a crime or yes, I knew that money was being moved from the exchange into the hedge fund and I was doing it to cover the losses. You will never, he doesn't say that in your book. He's never going to say that to anybody. Correct. And so at the end of the day, regardless of, you know, the people who have, have cooperated and regardless of their testimony, even if he is convicted, you will never get probably I don't think a confession out of him one way or another. And so what I love about that is that's the nature of our system around trust and around looking at evidence. And I think what your book does is it leaves open that central enigma about anyone who is accused of or involved in something that looks like fraud, which is, um, and which is, you know, did they intend, is this whole thing a sham where they're trying to cheat people, which does not seem to be the case with him? Or is it kind of an Achilles heel? Um, and the, the Achilles heel is a combination of being too devoted to math and numbers and probabilities and also creating chaos around you and falling prey to that as a victim, right? So the question is, is he sort of like make a mess of things? And, you know, as he said, I fucked up. And didn't really have a guilty mind. That might not help him in, in court, but in terms of more, in terms of the moral weight of it, or instead, is that just the conditions he created around himself? Someone or someone like Donald Trump create chaos around me, and then I can do what I want in the chaos. I think that's the question I'm left with after reading this book. Does that make sense? It does, and it, it, it rhymes with something I was thinking. One of a half dozen things I was thinking that were kind of guides for me as I was writing the story that. I never thought I'm going to have any effect on a legal outcome. Um, that that I what I thought was, I didn't care. I didn't care to even uh, that. What I thought was, if this story, what I thought was, there's such a gap between the hot takes you get in, in about Sam Bankman Fried in in the media, both when things were great mm -hmm. and when things went fell apart. Yep. Okay. But, yep. Such a gap between those takes and what people thought he was and what I thought he was and what I understood. It was such a, a, a misapprehension that I thought if I can, I can jump into that gap and close that gap. So force people to see him for who he is better or worse, you know, for, 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 for better or worse, um, that it's going to cause people possibly to feel about this event differently than they might have felt. It's going, to, it's going to force him to grapple with feelings about this event rather than take a simple off the rack um, sort of attitude towards it. And that that was interesting. My, I asked my son, it's funny, kind of things are just popping into my head, but my, I have a 16 year old son, Walker Lewis, 
And uh, Walker would listen to me talk about both about Sam, about the story, about what I thought I might try to do. And he watched me grappling with the book and kind of rides to school. And at one point I said, you know, what do you think the purpose of me writing a book is? And he said, you know, Mm. he said of this book. And he said, I think you might get people to think differently about controversy that you might, that, that I think he said, I think that, there are all these things that happen. There's all this noise that happens when they happen. And everybody kind of hears the noise, internalizes the, some sort of simple message from it and moves on. That You can show that like in this case, and so in probably all cases, when Twitter explodes, there's some other thing going on that's much deeper, richer, more interesting. And you should just, you know, the radical act is to reserve judgment. It's like not to, not to jump in and be sure of one thing or the other. You can make people. So it was. It was interesting. He said that was his line. Was I think you can get people to think differently about controversy? And I thought that's an interesting take on the purpose of this thing. It wasn't the only purpose, but it was. It was. It became one of the purposes. It's like that was clearly naturally going to fall out of this story. That it, it just it, you can't you can't have marinated in any of the media around this event. Pick up the book honestly and read it, unless you think I'm like a liar or a fabulist and making stuff up. And come away thinking anything but I didn't know this. <laughs> you know, I this is more comp I, this is more complicated yeah. than I thought. Well, what well, to me, I mean, there's so oh, gosh, my brain is like, oh, there, there's so many when you talk about thinking differently about controversy, as you were talking, I was thinking about the way this book makes me think differently about law. I tend to write in the area of sort of, you know, the way law can um you know, law can, uh, well, my book on the financial crisis yep. was about sort of the deregulation, right, that that enabled the toxic mortgage uh, crash. Yep. But I'm thinking here, like, you have, you have sort of, you know, when, and it's kind of like the controversy thing. When something, you know, when, when, when something implodes and someone's on their way down, Everyone comes in and circles the corpse and tries to get their piece of to piece of yep. it. And you know, law did not. You know, we have this issue with, um, you know, how to regulate crypto. And you know, as 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 folks probably most folks know, you know, this idea of having a non fiat, a non government backed sort of private peer to peer currency arose out of the financial crisis in 2008 and that sort of white paper from someone who may or may not exist. Um, and this, and, and, and it came from, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from sort of a good place, but, um, at the end of the day, uh, it turned out not to be sort of a decentralized peer to peer currency. There was a lot of problems around trust and around, you know, all these different things, but for years and years, you know, we're talking about going back to 2008, the regulators didn't act. I mean, ultimately, you know, as you note in the book, at some point they decide that, okay, we're going to treat something like a pure coin, like Bitcoin um, as a commodity, because that's what it seems to be as opposed to a currency or maybe a security. But then they sort of want to treat these ICOs, these initial coin offerings, just like they're issuing stocks. So maybe that should be regulated as a security. But the regulators just sort of stood back didn't do much. This thing grows, unlike something like Napster, right? Like when Napster was doing the file sharing of music and it was this giant business, you know, there was a crackdown and then that business was killed and recreated in a way that was within the regulatory frame. I mean, crypto was allowed to grow and grow and grow. And then when you start having, and because it was growing in the shadows. In in a kind of, in in a largely stateless environment, right? In a largely stateless environment, where it was very hard, you know, for the for the, the you know the sort of the 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 case, the, the case for crypto was you know easier tr- easier way to transact. You don't have to you know rely on the banking system. Maybe some anonymity, stable value. In some cases, none of those things turned out to be fully true. But especially not because when you have these folks operating outside of the the regulated system, you know, then you're going to find people who. Are taking advantage, you know. It's not going to all be on the up and up. So, so all this happens, and then when when the crash comes, you know, then the regulators come in, and you know, they find the crimes. You know, they, you know, I know these statutes well. They're pretty broad. You find, you know, you find the fraud, you prosecute people, and then, as you know, the part I loved in your book, which I hadn't thought about, was a bankruptcy trustee. Yeah. 
Then the bankruptcy trustee comes in um, doing what they're supposed to do, which is try to claw back as much as they can from the entities that file for bankruptcy. I think it's Al- Almeida as well as the FTX. Yep entity. I can't remember, go for bankruptcy, right? So it's a trustee's job to claw all this back. But stuff gets pretty dodgy because if we're, if at the outset, if the metaphor is, you know, a metaphor, if the, if the rule is we want people to be fa- full and fair disclosure about their businesses, honest about the numbers. And one of the big questions is, you know, was SBF fully transparent about, you know, it doesn't seem like he was, but he thought it wasn't a big deal, maybe to be fully transparent. But then we get to this bankruptcy trustee who doesn't really have a great use, as you note in your book, for accurate numbers, like this catch-22 you're describing where he's trying to claw back money from someone who got a bonus paid in, I forget the name of the serum. company it was that you were- But yeah, that's- Serum. So, you know, and for- per- yeah, this, Go this, ahead. This, so, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so, like, I love this, like, so, so, this, so this gray area that- So, yeah, so go ahead. Back, backing away from the story a minute. Okay. One of the ways I thought about what this book is, is it's social satire and uh, and as engineered by this crypto wonder kid who goes from having no money to having twenty two and a half billion dollars in about 18 months. And he and then he starts to. <laughs> I'm laughing now. It's like Chauncey. Yeah, Gardner, yeah. Right? And, then yeah. He, and then with his twenty two and a half billion dollars because of how he is and how he thinks about the world, um, he starts stress testing system after system, the system of political donations, the financial system, media, philanthropy. And uh, th- th- that's what interests me in the first place. And revealing mm-hmm. things about those systems. It was funny to me that even after he collapses, he continues to reveal things about systems, the criminal justice system, but also the bankruptcy system. And I had no idea how, ba- how the bankruptcy system worked. I didn't know that the SEC used to regulate bankruptcies back in the 70s and 80s, and then they gave it up. And, and so the only check on bankruptcy, on the bankruptcy people, and bankruptcy is an unbelievably lucrative thing. You, if bankruptcy lawyers can get their hands on a corpse that's as fat as FTX's, where there's billions and billions of dollars, they can make a billion dollars. Uh, they, 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 it, right. right. And the bankruptcy judge has to approve those fees. But I worked for a law firm that made a lot of money on bankruptcy. I wasn't in that department. So yes, it's very, they, it's, uh, you want to have your clients do deals, but then once they collapse, you can be there to clean up the mess. Once, the, yeah. once they've got the corpse, once it's in the bankruptcy system, several things are going on at once. One is everybody involved is getting paid by the hour, you know, and sometimes it's $2,000 an hour. So the bankruptcy of FTX, they're already at like $400 million in, char- in fees charged. And some an outside creditor did an analysis for me and they said it's going to cost a billion dollars. Lawyers, advisors are going to make a billion dollars off of the bankruptcy of FTX. Mm-hmm. The only check mm-hmm. now that the SEC doesn't isn't supervising this is this character inside the Department of Justice who's called a bankruptcy trustee. But the bankruptcy trust and who, and who actually filed something a, a, a complaint with the bankruptcy judge in this case saying these lawyers should not be the lawyers for the bankruptcy. They were the lawyers for FTX before when everything was good. That they're, they, you know, they, they're among other things, they are in possession of lots of criminal evidence, possibly criminal evidence, and they may be implicated. What on earth are they doing running the bankruptcy? But those lawyers actually pushed Sam very hard to file for bankruptcy in the first place and then seized it as, as their kind of their business. Um, but the fact that the, you, the trustee has no power, that all he can do is write the, is kind of bitch and moan to the bankruptcy judge. And the bankruptcy judge is often himself a former bankruptcy lawyer. It starts to have this whiff of just like these insiders are figuring out how to get, make as much money as they can. And everybody forgets the purpose of this thing. The purpose of this thing is to get the money back to the creditors, right? And and so their incentives are to make it go on as long as possible, make it as complicated as possible, and and uh, and charge as much as possible. That's different from getting all the monies back back to the creditors. And they so they do things like that are just seem to me if you're just an innocent person walking in, insane. So one thing we know about Sam Bankman Fried's empire was that it was highly chaotic sloppy and Sam Bankman Freed himself would know where some money was in some wallet when, where no one else did. You would think they would at least interview Sam Bankman Freed and ask like, do you know where any money is? But they instantly say, no, we're not going to do that. Thus making the job far more complicated and taking it, it'll take much more time to do it. But lo and behold, 
here we are, whatever it is, almost a year later, and of the $8.6 billion in customer deposits that are missing, they've said they found $7.3 billion in liquid assets already. And, they, and they're, and they're wow. sitting on piles of investments, one of which we know is worth about a billion dollars, maybe more. Uh, and you look at it and you say, like, in a different world, if it wasn't, if there wasn't a human being, if instead of being paid by the hour to make it as complicated and go on as long as possible, you had someone come in and say, you're only going to get paid for the job, get it done as quickly as possible. Um, you wonder if, like, it might not be over now and everybody would have gotten their money back. Uh, and and, and Ne that doesn't mean that that doesn't absolve Sam Beckman Frain of wrongdoing, but it does cast the whole thing in a different kind of light. Yeah. And I think, um, I think on, to this point, you know, and it, when you say, well, you know, I thought the purpose, the role of the trustee is to expand the bankruptcy estate so that the creditors can be made as close to whole as possible, right? Um, because it's an insolvency. And maybe if there's money left, it could go to the equity holders, which would be, I guess, Gary, in, in the case of Alameda, Gary and, and Sam, and in the case of FTX, I think there's more yeah. um, than them, but I'm not sure. But but I think that ignores um, you know, what economists call the agency problem, right? Everyone has their own, everyone has their own personal agenda and stake, and there are conflicts of interest inherent in anything. And so this is where I think this leads me back to what I think Sam's biggest Achilles heel was, and this goes to his sort of disdain for reading mm -hmm. and his um, respect more for just the numbers and the gamble is that, you know, he he forgot you know, everything he learned when, when he was kind of winning those sort of wagers on the floor at Jane Street Capital. Remember the whole wager, like, you know, the mini dice thing example you give, or if the guy, if someone's asking you the question, what are the odds that I would have, you know, be related to a major league baseball player? If someone's asking you that question, they've got some sort of stake in it. And so I think part of maybe the arrogance of youth and being utterly brilliant is sometimes people who are utterly brilliant in one arena cannot see their blind spots in another arena. And that he just dismisses Shakespeare as, well, Shakespeare's not that great <laughs> because of the probab wait, because of the probabilities that the greatest writer would have been born then as a percentage of the number of people who lived in the world. And also saying that she also missing the point, thinking that it was Shakespeare's plots that made his writing brilliant, which is not actually what the point was. And he just sort of dismissing all adults. And the thing that he needed were, you know, did he not know? It's kind of reminds me of, um, I'm kind of veering here, but it kind of reminds me of the folks at um, AIG Financial Products when the, you know, selling credit default swaps. And they're like, they, they just thought that it wouldn't, they forgot about the margin call. Yeah. Right. And so this is the same thing with him. This, he didn't know that bankruptcy could be a margin call. Like he didn't, he didn't understand that once, once things that there was a, that, it's not just about the numbers. It's about how the sort of anthropological and the systems like that you're talking about, as flawed as these other systems are, when power changes hands and he loses control, he doesn't get to dictate the game. It's no longer a video game. And worse than that, they won't let him even play the game. Yeah. And I just don't know that he, he could see that coming. And that seems to be one of his, uh, one of his, his greatest flaw i would say it, it's also what makes him interesting as a character though because yeah. that he is a kind of got a martian-like view of the world and systems mm -hmm. start and but the but a martian who is contemptuous of humans and uh, especially yeah. grown-up humans anybody over the age of about 35 <laughs> so he is almost assumes coming out of the block that i don't know when he's trying to figure out how to um influence an election with money that nobody who's ever thought about it has anything to say that's useful. And they're going to go figure it out. They're going to go <laughs> figure it out on their own. And when, when you do this, two things happen. You make a lot of stupid mistakes uh, because there are a lot of things you could have just avoided because someone actually could have told you don't do that and you should have listened to them. But every now and then you find mm -hmm. some something, you see something that other people don't see. Absolutely. And very broadly right. in the life of Sam Bankman Free, you could see why he gets more and more confident in his approach to life because, yeah. he, because by the age of 29, he's the richest person in the world under 30. He said that his, you know, yeah, there were mistakes, but on, on balance, this is really working for me. 
And uh, and it, in addition, he's psychologically incapable of being anything else. Like he just taking on board any kind of like external wisdom just is not in his repertoire. Um, so, but it does create, this is one simple, one simple explanation to what happened. And it's the explanation given to me by the Bahamas regulator, the person who uh-huh. poked Sam Bankman fried to the, uh, to, to the Bahamas in the first place. Her name was a woman named exactly. Christina Roll. Basically she said, you know, mm-hmm. if you made me put this into a sentence, Sam needed grownups. He needed grownups in his world and he didn't have any grownups in his world. That's an oversimplification. There's a lot more going on, but it was certainly true that they just, they, they, the, the boring, the boring and firm accountant in the middle of FTX or Alameda in the beginning of 19 uh, of 2021 would have s- prevented this ever from happening. That there were so many ways for this not to happen the way it went down. It just re- required someone to, to sort of impose some norms some some of the known the some of the norms of grown up financial life upon the upon the company and your your point about regulators i mean the regulatory approach which had the effect of kind of turning all crypto people into pirates that, that sort of the great regulators were the way they would regulate they would they wouldn't really be very clear about what you could do they would just defi- fine you if you did something that they didn't like but ra- not never really establishing a framework for it meant that it meant that any serious reputable grown-up was always a little uncomfortable getting too close to crypto. So they kind of created it. They sure. kind of created an, an environment which the grown-ups were not going to show up. Uh, it's a little overstating it, but but it, it, that, they had that effect. And that's it, and that's also because you know because of some you know some of the some of the non you know the the accounting wasn't really clear you know you, it's kind of if you're a regulator and you put your fingerprints on something and you can't see it all then you could be you, held oh i can understand exactly why they've done what they've done it's a hairball and and yeah. you'd rather just turn not, not have to deal with it hope it all falls apart but once it's a once there are once the market value of crypto is three trillion dollars and you've got these social forces at play and the social forces take the form of people like sam bankman fried with you know tens of billions of dollars at the disposal doing every which of influencing the society every which way you kind of got to do something i think well that's the thing and you know you note that finally janet yellen treasury secretary was looking into this and this you know as someone who's very interested in you know the intersection between the sort of tradi- so called traditional regulated banking system and shadow banking um the, 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 it's always the contagion effect right we're always afraid of well what if some of the money the actual real money that was invested in some of these things, you know, to put in reserve was put in sort of really solid assets, right? And any fire sale, which happens even when a fully regulated system, when there's any kind of bank run, it could be interest rate change. Anything that requires that 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 triggers people pulling their money out of a system could force the sale of assets, and that could have a sort of downward spiraling effect on the on the whole economy. And yet, you know regulators can't see through these kind of quasi banks. And so it's kind of a similar story um, that we've seen before. And that, and that's kind of like, um, you know, and I, and I, and I get why in some ways we can say these folks are pirates, but you know, same things going on in investment, investment banking, those risks have happened before too, a similar bubble. Um, The thing about Sam that I find super interesting though, are the things that, uh, you know, both his, the the Santa Claus problem. (laughs) So, so, you know, in terms of the Santa Claus, you know, like I, I never believed in, oh, spoiler alert, people were talking about Santa Claus, okay? So, yeah, I never <laughs> believed in Santa Claus. Um, maybe it's because I'm Jewish and it just wasn't a thing, although we had, you know, we had the gifts, but I always knew it was my parents. And, like, who in the world, uh, I mean, I don't understand why anyone would think it would be actually possible for someone to fly around and go through all the chimneys. Not everybody has chimneys. How many Santa Clauses would there be? Like, it never made any sense to me. So. I'm sympathetic to that. And also this idea, I like this idea that he thought, well, okay, fine. It's just kids who are brainwashed. And then he realized how much Santa Claus was like a, uh, what is a gateway drug to the idea of believing in a kind of white, you know, 
a white bearded God. I mean, the similarities are, are, so, are just right there in your face. And, you know, the, uh, the idea of mass delusion, I mean, you know, you can understand in the abstract some of these ideas. And so therefore, in reality, you know, is any kind of fiat currency not backed by gold, you know, inherently a Ponzi scheme. Et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I can, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go to these abstractions because I think about these things all the time. So I'm sympathetic to him up into the point though, where I don't see that he always um, can distinguish between levels of mass delusion. Like some mass delusions are so hardwired that we're going to continue with those and others are just too new for people. Um, anyway, I'm, it's just a, no, you, just you a, said, you know, thought. this, this, the difference maybe between you and Sam Bankman Freed, apropos of Santa Claus, is that Sam Bankman, Sam Bankman <laughs> Freed, when he realizes some of his lower school classmates believe in Santa, um, you know, he'd heard of Santa, like he thought of Santa like Bugs Bunny, like a character This is on TV. And, but when he realizes right. Christmas is coming and all, all, all of his classmates are expecting this guy to go down their chimney and leave them presents and all the rest, he's blown away. Like it really bothers him. So it isn't just he doesn't believe right. in Santa. It's that other people believe in Santa drives him up a wall. He sits in his room, thinks about it for days. Like, what does this say about people? And it's so funny to think about a little kid having that kind of response. Yeah. It isn't it's sort of like, what are these people, these human beings I've been I've been right. with? What, what else is rattling around in their heads? Uh, it's it's a moment. In, but my what yeah. I but it's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, but Ed. And- no, it's funny because I, I use that metaphor sometimes. I think about, you know, I love Santa Claus to me has always been a nice metaphor for things like uh, other things like money because, um, you know, and on the one hand, we can say Santa Claus doesn't exist. Like you and I think that. But on the other hand, it's a multi billion dollar industry, Santa it's Claus. Probably, yeah. So Santa Claus really kind hundreds of, of Hundreds of billions, in that probably. Way. Yes. So yeah, yeah, Santa Claus, you know, yes, so- we willed into existence with our material greed. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but the, the the thing the other so the the thing that the the um, some of the other flags are um, I forgot who the character was. It wasn't out of Sam's uh, mind. It was one of the other folks who was like, you know, law is kind of you know you don't really have to follow the. Oh wait, right. This is when they needed to get someone to be a front trader for them. I think in Korea, and yep. I think it was Nishad, kind of treating law like it was optional. And this is like on page 92. Yep. This is one of the breadcrumbs that I think you put in. Thank the you very much for noticing so it. Ambiguity. Thank you for noticing it. You're the first one to bring. <laughs> there are a bunch of these breadcrumbs, and that is one of the breadcrumbs. You are absolutely right. So you want to go ahead and read it? it, it you, yeah. Yeah. Do you want no, to read you, that? I don't, I don't have do you it. You go ahead and do it. Okay. I got it. I got it. So, um, so it says that uh, when they got it kind of involved and they had to deal with, they had to deal, they had to use a, a, a crypto exchange in Korea because that was kind of the only place um, that they, they could. Can I, no, I explain why they were doing let me, so it. Let's says, explain why. Oh, yeah. Say, so say, yeah. what they were doing is they okay. were, tra- this is before they create their exchange, they're trying to tra- arbitrage crypto prices. And and Bitcoin in, in South Korea is trading at a 30% a premium to Bitcoin in America. Oh, so right. sell, they want to sell Bitcoin in South Korea and buy it in America and clear 30% profit risklessly. The problem is they need to have an account on the Korean exchange and to be South on a South Korean crypto exchange, you have to be South Korean. So that's, they, 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 they hire some graduate student who they know to front them and pretend to be them, which is probably illegal, almost certainly illegal. Right. It reminds me kind of like Mark of, I don't know the laws in Korea, right? So it reminds me of like Michael Milken and the parking stuff, but okay. So this is the, so, uh, this is quoting Nishad. He said, it was borderline illegal, but in practice, who goes after you when, when you do this? No one. This is what, that's where I learned what the law is. The law is what happens, not what is written. So he's an ultimate legal realist. Um, and he's also reflecting how, yeah, people can get away with things until they don't. But this is such, and he's also, this he's is all, such a red flag. And he's also 26 years old and has never had any experience yeah. in life except for working for this crypto company. Yeah. I mean, I think the reason why I'm able to see these breadcrumbs um, and red flags is because when I was right out of law school in my 20s, I the firm life was too intense. And I got this really sweet job working as an in-house counsel at this marketing company in Stanford, Connecticut. I was doing a reverse commute from New York. And come to find out a couple of years later that these folks were literally cooking the books. And it was called, the company was called Sendin. And it was like the largest stock drop in U.S. history when the truth came out. It was like 
uh, and I, I, you know, it's, it's you really were working, you were working, you were working. working for them when it happened. Yeah. And you didn't sense it. Oh, I have. Well, this is the thing. I went back, Michael, and there were these red flags, you know, these little things. Cause I was a very small company. We, we had merged with a big company in New Jersey and we were the small scrappy startup in Connecticut. And there were little flags that I noticed in the way that, you know, I was young, but I didn't think much about it. And I went back to, in my mind, you know, and revisited those. What, had I, you know, was I ignoring these signs? And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think I was, you know, and I think I just liked, I think I always had this side of me that was like, you know, I'm more creative than more law- than most lawyers. I want to be, you know, where the action is. I'd rather be, you know. And so I just didn't know. There was nothing that anyone told me to do that was illegal. But it was like this little, these little subtle things that were kind of, you know, it's like the you're the boiled frog, like little things that I felt like they were turning the heat up. And yeah, ultimately, our our chairman Walter Forbes went to prison, but he was tried three times. There were two hung juries, and it turns out it was Chris Christie who brought that case. Oh. Um, anyway, so I, I'm aware of, and, and these people were perfect. Yeah, only two people went to prison. It's a whole, it's a long story, but, um, uh, and, you know, I, you know, I definitely look back on that. And I think that started my interest in white collar crime because you could never have known that these folks were crooks. And I think looking back, one of these red flags was um, someone, I don't want to name who the person is because this person didn't go to prison, but they would speak about things like, well, is that really material? The, the the thing, the, the thing that they were doing. This is stuff a lot of companies were doing back in the in the uh, in the nineties, which was they would have these pooling mergers. Yep. I don't know if you know this whole thing, and so that you could like merge with another company, and if it was treated as a pooling, you didn't have to write down. You didn't have to write down to book value the assets you were buying. You could just act as if you owned them all the yep. time. And then they had these giant merger reserves. So the merger reserves. Let's say whatever they're doing a merger, and you're supposed to use a merger reserve. You set it aside as a bookkeeping item to say, you know, we had legal costs, we had integration of systems costs, whatever. And so that you would have pro forma financials where you would say, look, we earned X per share, um, other than the fact that we had this merger, which means we lost a little bit. But the, but what they were really doing is drawing down against the merger reserve, regular operating expenses. This was the cookie jar stuff that everyone was yep. doing. Arthur Levitt talked about it at the time. I knew nothing about finance. when I, I went there to be a marketing right. lawyer. And then I left there. I went, I stayed around after the forensic audits ended. And I went and worked at Fidelity Investments for two reasons. One, because now I was fascinated right. with how money worked. And two, because the the name Fidelity, I was like, well, that's going to you know clean up my, my resume because I didn't want this send it on my resume forever. But anyway, so that was my story. So, so I, I look at this and I look at this. That's why I see all all of these red flags, but but, but uh, so see... take your experience, your experience, and port it. it try to imagine yeah. porting you in out of college or law school or wherever you're coming from, yeah. into crypto. And so your first oh your first God. experience in the world is this this whole other world that has essentially no real rules or regulations. It has norms. I, I would have been would have, terrible. Have, I would have been living in the condo and the Bahamas. You, w- you wouldn't sure. have known. You wouldn't have known. Them. What no. was normal and what was not normal? You would have been normal to crypto, nope. rather than the world didn't right. touch the the normal world. And everybody's twenty six years old. I should and say everybody's getting rich. I should say that I, this company I was working for was an early e commerce company, right? And so if they if they had been honest, the the, the sad truth of it is people said later if Walter Forbes had been honest about what was really going on in the books, you know, it could have been a company like Amazon. I mean, we owned. We owned Match.com at oh. one point. We owned, oh yeah, oh that that was a whole other bunch of legal issues. Let me tell you, but we were a young and up and coming, you know, e-commerce company. And anyway, so the IRS, so I, I see, and you're right. I can see these people are so young, and they're you're right. They're only around young people. So this is, you know, it, but so now I want to ask you. I guess there's two threads before we go that I want to pick okay. up. Um, Okay, so one has to do with my having met Joe McGinnis years ago, well before I had a podcast, before there are podcasts. And as you know, he was the author of Fatal Vision. Have you met Joe before? Never met him. So I I love the book Fatal Vision because I read it right after I read, um, you know, I love Truman Capote. Like I'm a huge true crime crime narrative nonfiction. Yeah. And so I don't read that stuff anymore as much. um, But when I read Fatal Vision um, about, you know, about his take, 
on uh, on Jeffrey McDonald, you know, allegedly, I guess he's been convicted of murdering his wife in 1970. And then I later read Janet Malcolm, who wrote for The New Yorker, her critique of that, right? It's called The Journalist and the Murderer. And there was, there was an ethical critique because I, I my understanding is McDonald had hired McGinnis to write a book about him. And sort of halfway through the project, McGinnis decided, oh, this guy is guilty. Right. And wrote that book. And he ended up getting sued. And then it ended up setting a lot of court. And um, McDonald is still in prison. Sadly, McGinnis, he, he passed away, I think, two years after I met mm. with him in, in 2014. Unrelated to my meeting with him, I swear. Um, that, that makes but, me feel safer. But that's an... Yeah, no, no, no. Don't worry. Don't just don't eat the just don't drink the, you know, no, but it was some kind of cancer. But, it, you know, after he tried to do that Sarah Palin book, remember, he yep. moved in next to her house and tried to. Yeah, yeah. So that's the situation. And he was heavily criticized for that. And then I think about for turning on his for turning, ask for you, turning on his subject, turning on. Right. And so I guess I would ask you, I'm assuming that you were not hired by Sam. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, oh, my God. What a funny idea. <laughs> no. So, so I, I was, so I the way it happened, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> I explain how it happens. A friend asked me to meet, meet with him and evaluate him for his business deal. And I, I had no idea who he was or what FTX was. And he turns up on my porch in Berkeley, California and talks to me for two hours. And at the end of the two hours, I just said, can I just hang around and watch? I just want to see what's going to happen here. It's so outrageous what's happened to you already. Uh, so that's how it starts. And no, n- I know didn't pay me any money. Didn't give me FTX shares. No, Good. I wasn't. No, that would be disaster. That'd Good. be a disaster. And not worth. I know. I mean, that would be. I, <laughs> I don't need. I don't, I need, I don't actually. Yeah, I don't need any more money. <laughs> I didn't think so. That didn't seem like your kind of your style. <laughs> Um, but so, but the point is like now we're in, so this pivots to the next part, which is now, you know, I think that I read somewhere that you'd sold them the film rights and when the movie is made, assuming, or when the screenplay is written, um, we're going to have the trial in the rear view mirror. And I wonder what that does, um, how that's going to, I know you had this other stuff on the cutting room floor, but that's sort of a, a different narrative, but do you think at some point, I mean, how do you do? Because if the whole I may, point of I may, this book, I may, this book I may, ambiguity, what are you going to do I may, next? I may this? write yeah. a hundred and fifty page book about the trial uh, and about the, about his. Okay. but it, it seemed really clear to me since the book was about this person's ambition to make infinite dollars to res- solve some huge existential problems right. of existence. The effect of yeah, altruism, that, that, which we haven't that, talked that, about. Yeah, yeah. Once that yeah. collapsed and this whole empire collapsed, and we were in Ozymandias mm-hmm. land. That, I just thought that's the end of the story. That's the end of this story. There's this other story that's about to start, like how the society processes him legally. Uh, and in, how will a movie deal with it? Probably with like a little black card at the end, uh, like Sam Bankman fried is now in jail for 120 years or whatever it is. Uh, oh, I don't think it's going to be 120 given the sentencing guidelines. My prediction is, is anywhere between six and 11 years. Really? Is that too well, low? I can tell you, you think so 20? I don't know anything about this, but I, except that I interviewed uh, a woman who had been a prosecutor until very recently in that same office in the Southern District of New York, who is now a defense lawyer. And I uh-huh. asked her before the trial started, um, if you were defending him, what would you have accepted as a, what would have excited you as a plea deal? Like what would the government have, have if they had offered it, you say, we got to take it. And she said 10 years. <laughs> so she thought, she thought t- he would be yeah. very lucky. If he got in a plea deal, okay. ten years. So uh, he's facing, like in theory, one hundred and twenty. Well, yeah, but in, 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 yes, but that I never mean, happens on the I guidelines. Know, if you've looked at those the, charts, what yeah. is also going on is he so you know the judge decides the sentence, the jury decides whether he's guilty, and the ju- oh, it's Judge Kaplan, and, too, and yeah. the judge is, has expressed immense irritation with him. He's been the judge clearly does not is not like on his side, uh, so. Judges seems almost a little hostile, so I don't know where that leads. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I love Judge Kaplan. So yeah, so that's yeah. I mean, he doesn't. I think that. I mean, the trouble is, you know, people are on paper innocent till proven guilty, but um, it's not great when everyone who worked with you is testifying that they committed crimes. It's with also you. just not just that's not, not great. great. I mean, innocent. If this is a if, this is a curious stat. Innocent till proven guilty. Uh, last year, there were 77,000 people charged by the federal government with crimes. 90, 99.6% were either pled guilty or lost in court and were or convicted. Only 0.4% were acquitted. 
So um, either the either the federal prosecutors are unbelievably gifted at identifying who's guilty before they take them to court, or the system is actually kind of skewed against the defendant. And well, I have a book for you to read. My friend, I had her on the show, Carissa Byrne Hessek, wrote a book called Punishment Without Trial. Huh why a plea bargaining is a bad deal. And she talks about, um, you know, what, you know, the part of the reason why, you know, the statutes you're talking about, if you add it all up, yeah. they, they really want these very, very long sentences because they become a bargaining That's tool right. because there aren't enough resources. There aren't enough resources to try That's everybody, right. but it really does deprive people of, of their, justice. their right to a trial. I mean, yeah. And this is someone, I mean, you know, this is someone super wealthy though, right? What she's talking about is if you don't have money, yeah, especially if you're middle class as opposed to poor, where they're going to give you counsel, you have to. So the truth out. about- I th- You're going to bankrupt your so family. So I think they've already bankrupted Sam's family. I, I, they're, I think that they're, they're oh. out of money. They're basically out of money for the lawyers. So um, it isn't, he's, he's, he's not as wealthy as, he's not a really rich person now fighting this, but you're right. Uh, unless you're a really rich person, you're facing someone with unlimited resources. And there's some rules that are kind of skewed against you. I don't completely, you will understand this. I don't completely, but it was surprising to me how much easier it was for the government to force someone to testify or compel someone to testify than it was for, for Sam's lawyers. The Sam's lawyers can kind of ask, could you please come back from China and, and sit on a witness stand and say something about this? And the person can just say no, and they can't really get them out of China. The pr- in terms of getting a subpoena. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the government prosecutors very easily got people into the, are getting people into the courtroom. I do feel awful for his parents, which is a whole other situation. Um, and I know that they, it's, it would be shocking to me that they thought they were engaged in any kind of, any kind of fraud. Um, and so I, I'm just so confused about, about that. But given, given that Sam is a good game player and a really good gambler, it would surprise me if he didn't have some money stashed away somewhere for his effective altruism pursuits later. Would it surprise you to find out that later that there was was some offshore entity somewhere um, that had a bank account somewhere just as a as a sort of safety in bell? his name. Not in his name, in the name of, of some kind of shell company. But that he had control, that he had control over. over. That it was like a big pile of money. Mm-hmm. Surpri- it would surprise me. It wouldn't. Sh- it wouldn't shock me. It would surprise me, though. Yes. Uh, I mean, there why, are. Why, there are, why would it? Well, why? I, one is that just like the nature of his enterprise, there was money. There were money in wallets in obscure crypto exchanges. There were money in. Be- there was money. I mean, when they're falling apart, they get a call from a local bank in the Bahamas saying, you have an account with $300 million in it, Did, and they didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. So it's this John Ray, the bank bankruptcy people are still finding money all over the place. Sam, Sam, so, well, so the answer is yes, then. Yeah. I mean, in other yeah, words, there's, there's, if there's, they don't and, know. And, and, and <laughs> FTX people have told me there's no way they're going to find all the money we know in these wallets. You'd have to have all of us there helping them find it. There's no way going to find all the stuff. And so there's stuff out there. It's like, you know what it is? It's like an unbelievably complicated Easter egg hunt. And the kids come back and the adults can't remember where they put the eggs. And there are six eggs at the end of the hunt that nobody ever finds. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's six eggs after the hunt that no one ever finds. Do I think that Sam, in a really diabolical way, like took $500 million, stuck it somewhere, and he's got access to it? I, I, I asked, you know, the people closest to him about this. And some said yes and some said no. So uh, they, 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 everybody had a different view. I would, I would bet no, but I, w- I wouldn't give you great odds. So if it's not diabolical, it could be absent-mindedly. Oh, yeah, totally. that, could and then... that could have happened. Well, thank you so much for your time, Michael. All right, Jen. All right, thank you. Thanks for reading it. Bye. I really enjoyed that conversation with Michael Lewis. As you know, uh, I have already had on the podcast uh, the author of co-author of Easy Money, Ben McKenzie. So we've already talked a little bit about crypto, and so this is the net the, this the second second book uh, focusing on that entire industry and its implosion. And after. Um, after today, uh, when we're covering Going Infinite by Michael Lewis, we will also, in a future podcast, be 
uh, talking about Number Go Up when I'm in conversation with author Zeke Foe. So between these three episodes, I'm hoping that listeners get different takes on the individuals involved and what went down. I think what's super interesting um, about Michael Lewis's book is that, as he notes, he had unusual access, not just to Sam Bankman-Free, but to many of the players surrounding him um, at Almeida Research and FTX, the two businesses that he uh, had majority ownership of and control. And I also think it's really good, um, as, as I think he said his son said, is that you're getting, with this book, a, you know, a, a different kind of take on controversy. This book makes you do the hard work. You as a reader have to follow the breadcrumbs and make your own determination about what went down. Uh, Michael is reporting what he sees um, and he's not making out any of the folks involved in a sort of black or white way. I think it's it's uh, utterly fascinating for that reason. I also like where we landed, which is given that uh, Michael has said in the book and in our conversation that um, you know Sam Bankman Freed knows where all a bunch of these crypto type wallets are that have you know tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in them. And as he noted, you know the bankruptcy trustee he believes should have asked Sam where that was. The failure to do so means that that money is out there somewhere. And so I, I guess I would say, you know, whether or not we say it's diabolical or just careless, to the extent that he knows, if Sam actually knows there's money out there, there really is nothing stopping him, I think, from letting his lawyers know that and having his lawyers communicate that. Um, I'm not sure if he's not allowed to go on. I mean, obviously, he is now in custody and he's not allowed to go on the internet now. And I think that's part of the problem. And I know he has no access to the company system, but if he jogs his memory and he actually believes the numbers are not adding up and there must be some more somewhere, um, I hope that that's something um, that he can bring forward. Otherwise, I think a lot of us are going to be wondering about how much is stashed away somewhere. So thank you for joining us, and I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com, and you can also write to us at bookedup, P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.